Do you want to listen to a podcast? By who? Georgia GOP Congressman Doug Collins. How, how is it? The greatest thing I have ever heard in my whole life. I could not believe my ears. In this house, wherever the rules are disregarded, chaos and mob rule. It has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Hey everybody, uh, I've been promising it. We told you, Coach uh, Chan Gailey's going to be with us today on the Doug Collins podcast. Just after the break, you're going to get to hear Chuck Coach. And I, let me just tell you, it's going to be wild. Uh, Coach is unfiltered as ever. It's going to be great. I had the opportunity uh, to do this interview before doing the uh, our intro today. So let me just tell you, uh, great hot takes on this one. You're going to want to see this. Coach is just uh, give some good insight on both the pro level and uh, the college level. A lot of things uh, coming up. For the football season. Also, just want to give you a quick rundown. Hopefully, we're going to have uh, some more uh, in, getting scheduled here in the future with Tom Hoban's going to be coming on. Matt Whitaker's going to be coming on. Probably going to have Michelle Tafoya back pretty soon. Um, a lot of these different things going on in the next uh, few weeks and few months here leading up to not only hunting season, Michael Waddell, hopefully to get back on. Um, so we got hunting and football. I can just sense it in the air, folks. I'm getting excited. Uh, that time of the year is coming up. Uh, for football and for hunting and for just you know getting out, uh, good stuff happening. I want you to be a part of it here on the Doug Collins Podcast. But today, another great episode with the great coach, Chan Gailey. Hey, everybody. You know about Legacy Precious Metals. Legacy Precious Metals, you hear from them. Uh, we talk once a month. We talk about Legacy Precious Metals, talking about precious metals being part of your portfolio, how they're your navigator. Well, now they're not only navigating in a new way, uh, they're actually giving you a new way to buy gold and silver. In fact, Legacy Press Metals has put a, developed a revolutionary new online platform that allows you to invest in real gold and silver online. In a few easy steps, you can open an account online, select your metals of choice, and choose to have them stored in a vault or shipped to your door. I'm more of a ship to my door kind of person. I enjoy having them uh, with me, and but they can do it either way, and you can now do it online. It gives you real access to uh, a dashboard where you can track your portfolio growth in real time, anytime. You'll see transparent pricing on each coin and bar. This puts you in complete control of your money. This platform is free to sign up for. Just visit LegacyPMInvestments.com and open your account and see this new investing platform for yourself. Gold hedges against inflation and is against uh, and against a volatile stock market. A true diversified portfolio isn't just more stocks and bonds, but a different asset class. This platform allows you to make investments in gold and silver, no matter how small or large, with just a few clicks. Remember, do as I have done. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com and get started today. And now you've got a new tool to help you along in your investments. Hey folks, MyPillow is excited to bring to you their biggest bedding sale ever. For a limited time, you're going to get the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98. A set of pillowcases for only $9.98 and rejuvenate your bed with a MyPillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. $99.99, get a mattress pillow topper. Look, they come in all sizes. They got all kinds of stuff, uh, blankets. They've got duvets. They've got quilts. they got comforters. they got body pillows. they got bolster pillows. they got all that big, big discounts. And also, they're extending their money-back guarantee for Christmas until March 1, 2023, making them the perfect gift for your friends, your family, and for everyone you know. Folks, and just from a personal note here, I have the Giza Dream Sheets. They're on my bed right now. I slept on them last night. Some of the best sheets that we and Lisa and I have ever owned. They are worth, I mean, at this price, they're a steal. My wife and I have bought bed sheets, linens at much higher cost. It's supposedly much higher quality. These from my pillow are at the highest of quality. And at a price like this, you can't beat it. So go now to mypillow.com, use promo code Collins, C O L L I N S or call 1-800-986-3994 and you'll get huge discounts on all the MyPillow bedding products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98 and get all your shopping done while qualities last. And remember, put in that promo code Collins for these discounts. All right, Coach. A lot to talk about. Um, we've been prepping this for a while. We've had listeners and everybody ask, uh, you know, about, you know, coming up with a football season. We're under, well, next week, I guess it is, uh, the... Uh, Pros, you got rookies and um, some veterans starting back. I've always wanted this question, and, and let, let's just start off here. Let's start pros today, and then we'll get to college in a little bit because I've got some serious questions about college, and, and some are concerning 
and, and I think we're just seeing a little bit about it, but it would be interesting to look at. But I've always wondered that. Is there a standard? I mean, when you were head coaching in the NFL with you know, Dallas and others, you know, when you say rookies or have to report and some veterans, they sort of leave it open. Are those veterans that are in need of extra help or those veterans that you're not sure about or are those – what's the what's the standard? I've always heard that term and never really understood it. Well, normally it's your first-year players and – Anybody that was on your practice squad the year before, um, mm. those guys that are not sure if they're going to make it or not, they want to get there and get all the extra help and get all the extra knowledge and all the extra work that they can possibly get to help their fortunes to make the team that year. That It is veterans, but it's normally first-year guys, guys that are – trying to make the team that might be two or three year guys, that kind of yeah. player. Maybe coming off injury. Yep. It could be that guy that okay. that wants to go out and break in slowly before he gets to the full speed stuff. Right. That's it. Well, that, that brings up an interesting question for me in, in looking at this because and we know in college, like I think right now, if I'm not mistaken, college is sort of, they're, they can't do the, quote, organized practices, you know, those kind of things. But they can, you know, they still go to the gym. They still do the the stuff like that, which I'm assuming is not mandatory, but mandatory, wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but do, do the pros have those kind of downtimes as well? Are they pretty much, I mean, that they're professionals, they're just expected to stay in shape? Or do you have some times when they actually just – you know, you're basically saying you better be in the gym this spring and this summer, or, or, you know, you better be with us and we're monitoring you. Well, we monitored everything. Okay. Okay. There's nothing that's not monitored. Okay. Um, but you come back and uh, you used to do way back. Uh, you used to do a conditioning test. You know, when <laughs> I first started in the NFL, we did a 12 minute run or the 880 deal or whatever it was. But they don't do that anymore. Um, to be honest with you, the competition level is so high. If a guy doesn't come in in shape uh, or somewhere close to being in great shape, he's going to get hurt or get um, bypassed in a hurry. Uh, but we do, we do monitor everything in the NFL, and you're expected to be there um, at least, especially if you're a fringe guy. If you're – I mean, if you're a 10-year vet and you know you're going to play, yeah. you didn't expect the Tom Brady's and some <laughs> of those guys to be there all the time. But uh, there are some guys, you know, most of the guys would be around and would live there and work out, and they wanted to be around. Uh, yeah. To be honest with you, the thing that guys, when they retire, what they mm -hmm. miss the most is the camaraderie. Right. It's right. not the football it's the camaraderie of the locker room and the weight room and, and things like that. So um, it, they, they like to be there. Yeah. Well, it keeps them in going and getting out and, and everything else. And you see that, uh, you know, so much is out there nowadays. Um, I, okay. Quick off, off wall. We did a podcast called we do Friday's finest. It came out uh, last week and uh, we did the ESPYs and we had an interesting question uh, that came up coach. And I, we want to ask you Patrick Mahomes, was not only given the ESPY from ESPN for the best NF, best NFL player, but he was given the the ESPY for the best male athlete, all sports. Yeah, it, I mean, okay, we I said no, I, I call BS on that. I think he's a great athlete, but there's so many. I want your take. Is he is he the best athlete all sports? No, uh, <laughs> if you define athlete as run, jump, change direction, you know, athletic talent. Like I had two of the best ever. I had Deion Sanders and Calvin yeah. Johnson. Those are oh athletes God, yeah. now. <laughs> you know, those are guys that are amazing. They can catch it. They can throw it. They, they can do everything. And yeah. uh, so now if you're talking about production in your sport, now you're saying a different thing when you turn MVP athlete. You know, if you have produced in your sport amazingly, yeah. then that's a different that, that that's a different criteria. But if you say athlete, yeah, let's let's change that to most valuable performer. There you go. There you go. You know, well, yeah. 
I, I, James C., I was right. James and I had this, we went to this disagreement about what athlete means here. And it goes yeah. like DK Metcalf up in Seattle. I mean, he's a freak. I mean, yeah, he he's, is. He's just an athletic freak. But yet, Mahomes has the, it's like Brady. Bra- Nobody would ever confuse Tom Brady of being an athlete in the sense of the truest, fastest, quickest, moving, everything else. Right. But they also not going to confuse him for not one of the best quarterbacks ever to play the game. Right. And, exactly. Yeah. But I th- we just thought it was pretty interesting. And again, ESPN playing for the uh, – because they also, while we're at it, we'll, we'll jump to college one quick one here because I sort of probably made the whole Pac-12 mad uh, last week on this one. Basically, I called them the double A of SEC, but that's – Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that's cold. That's cold. <laughs> but here's the other one. Uh, Caleb Williams was voted the best college athlete last year for f- college football player. And I'm just, I'll be honest, good kid, good. I mean, and he's got some issues he needs to deal with. But I mean, he's an, I mean, he's athletic. He's big. He's got the quote. He, it reminds me of that. Did you ever watch the movie, Coach uh, Moneyball? Yes. Did you ever see that? Okay. Where they talked about, you know, I remember sitting around, and I would love to get your take on this. We, we, we get money balled in here, James. This is great. Um, they're sitting around the table when Brad Pitt, you know, comes in early in the movie, and they've lost their players, and all those scouts are sitting there. You know, he's got the speed. He's got the run. He's a no-head, pro-ready right now, you know, yes. kind of thing, about like, about like training day. And, um, I mean, everybody's got it with Caleb. It's about like uh, the Richards and Anthony Richardson, which we'll talk about here in a little bit too. But, um I just don't see it. And, and maybe I'm blind. I'm willing to say I'm wrong. But in the big games, he's not performed. And so, it, it's again, is that sort of an interesting play? I mean, for the Pac-12, maybe he's really good. But against bigger competition, Utah and others, he, he stumbled. Yes. Well, and again, you go back to what's your definition of athlete? You know, yeah. he's big, he's fast, he can run, he's a quarterback, he can throw it, he is elusive, uh, he can change direction, he is a great athlete. And to be honest with you, there are so many politics involved <laughs> making sure that you get somebody from the West Coast, somebody from the East Coast, somebody from the North, somebody from the South. They're, they're going to spread a few of those things around now so that, uh, everybody gets a oh, little yeah, yeah. happiness to them, so they're not <laughs> they're not idiots up there. They've got marketing people breathing <laughs> down their throat, just like I had PR people breathing down my throat. You know, talking about ticket sales. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, that is true. I mean, they they they, are, they so desperately want the LA media market to be viable in sports, and, and it just frankly just hasn't been for a, a long time now. In college, in particular, pro sports. Different aspect, you know, the yeah, pro different. basketball, you know, pro football, the Rams now, you know, the Chargers are there, but, um, you know, it's a little bit different there, but, the, but nobody, I mean, you show up in the Coliseum and half of it's not, I mean, three quarters of it's not even full. I yeah. mean, it's just, they're just struggling uh, with that. But I got a question because I'm, I'm tipping off the world here. I'm a not good golfer. I've gotten better though, coach. I've been seeing, uh, by the way, if anybody wants to know, Mike McCall Innsbruck golf course is a fabulous coach. The guy is amazing. He's really good. My drivers, by the way, getting really good. My short game. Well, we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, but anyway, but for those who don't know, Ch- coach Gailey is a good golfer. Okay. He, he is good. All right. Um, uh, Rick Neuheisel, Undoubtedly stays on the golf course more than a lot. Do you have you ever had the chance to be around Rick Neuheisel? Yeah, we played uh, actually uh, <laughs> early May. We played. Together. Oh, you went you went to that coach's. Uh... Yes. Yes. Oh my God! Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. was that? It was great. It was yeah. great. It's always great when you win. <laughs> I quit. You know, come on, coach, you're killing me, man. <laughs> you know, the uh, uh, but okay. Well, one of the things, the reason I brought up Neuheisel was not his golf game. Uh, or his radio show with the show pony. But the what I brought up was is he is the homer for Pac-12. Okay. And it looks like it's just continually to fall apart. I know we've jumped to, to college here for a second, but you know, that's the way this show goes. Um why is it I mean is it is it the marketing issue now? I mean, because the Pac-12, you're gonna see at least three teams from the Pac-12 and the top 25 that will not be there come you know, mid-season or toward the end of the year. Is it just because they are trying to get that balance, Coach? Is that is that a, is this the, the the rankings and the PR 
to let ESPN and others because they're, I mean, their media deal out there is terrible. They're losing athletes except for like USC, uh, Oregon, maybe, you know, I think, I think the coach out there, Dan's going to do a good, he, he's going to do as good as he can. Utah's been there. What is it with Pac-12? Cause it used to be when you and I, I was younger and you were as well. I mean, UCLA, USC, Notre Dame, that was football. I yes. mean, and, and all. So where do you see that? Because Neuheisel always is quick to defend the Pac-12. He's a Pac-12 guy. I get it. I'm an SEC guy. I get that. But they just, I mean, it just seems like they are trying too hard. Maybe that's the way to put it. Well, uh, there are a lot of things going on in uh, out West that um, have taken priority over football. Right. Um, uh, and I've, I've always said I'm not sure that the, the toughest players, the toughest high school players, the toughest college players um, go much further west than the Mississippi River. But I know Texas and then Oklahoma are out there, so I'm on, <laughs> I'm on now say the Rocky Mountains. Okay. And, um, but um, I, I just think that there's a toughness level and a work ethic level – an importance level um, mm. that we are around every day here uh, in the Southeastern Conference, you know, Big Ten, ACC. I think that um, th- that's just a tick higher. And when it's a tick higher, you, you and I both know anything that is worked at harder, that is tougher to do, and you got tougher people doing it, uh, the expectations are higher. You know, it, it, then it becomes a better level of, of play, of politics, of business, whatever you want to choose. Uh, if you work harder at it, you're tougher at it, uh, you're going to be more successful at it. Well, and I think that's the, the become the key. And speak, let's move back, though, to pro for a little bit, because I want to come back to college, like there's some more college stuff. You know, Colorado, I want to talk about Dion. You know, I mean, I think it's interesting the Pac-12 does have that. You know, I don't know how long they're going to stay, but we'll see. But let's go to pro back to pro for a little bit um, because it's going to get started quicker. And the, you know, the questions are out there this year. Um, but one thing has become interesting and you and I do a great job of talking about what I call the history of this game. And we talk about where it's come from, you know, the changes and everything else. But, but one thing that has become just so predominant in the game is the devaluing of running backs. And, you know, when you have a Dalvin Cook, a 1,400-yard rusher, you have uh, Ezekiel Elliott, when he's healthy and mentally, you know, uh, he's focused on the game, is a a solid, you know, straight up and down runner. And then you got Leonard Fournette, who has probably never reached the potential everybody thought Leonard Fournette was going to have. He's had good years, bad years. But all three have been on the free agent market now for several months. And they're all still sitting there, and we're a week away from starting – quote, starting football, what, I mean, I get it to a point, but are we changing the shape of football as we know it, Coach, into a sense of maybe that that you're going to go to more of a, I won't say a Canadian league, kind of just wide open defense kind of don't, but the running back position, are we going to start losing some of the best athletes and say, look, I'm 6'1", 230, I've been running back, I can run a 4'5", 40, 4'4", 40, I can be a better linebacker and get paid more money. Yes. And the other thing about it is there are more running backs out there in college football. I mean, Bug Tussle U has a good running back. Right. Everybody has everybody has a good running back. So uh, the you can get a almost as good a product for a lot less money. And so you don't end up paying their their longevity because of getting hit as much as they do. Uh, the only guy that's proven the test of time is the guy at Tennessee. He came from Alabama. Yep. You know, he's he, he has led the league and been at the top and stayed fairly healthy. The last couple of years he's gotten beat up a little bit, but he stayed fairly healthy and – you do, and they're committed to the run. They're a different team than everybody else. Right. Mike Vrabel's a different guy. So uh, it takes a mindset and it takes uh, a way to get to uh, to win football games uh, for a running back to become the the top dog because you know they're paying receivers and they're paying quarterbacks now. They're not paying running backs anymore. 
Yeah, and I think that's going to be – well, you know, and I was sitting here thinking as you were answering that question, it was a great – you know, uh, Henry up at, at Tennessee is a great example. But the one thing that got me about the question is, you know, if we were doing this podcast 15 years ago, you know, we would, what we'd be talking about is the demise of the fullback. Yes, that's exactly and, right. And the fullback is just almost no longer existent. I oh, mean, there's, kids, there's kids out there playing right now say, what position are you talking about? What's that called? A fullback. Yeah, they, never, they never even heard of one. You know, yeah. which is crazy. It, it is crazy. And, you um, you know, you look at it from a perspective of, you know, saying I got a big kick. Because if you look on the Instagram, the great thing about some of this stuff on social media, it's mostly boring. But if you're sitting on a plane board, there's some things that come up and there's a, a thing, the old sports. And there's been some videos run lately of the teams from the 70s and 60s, 70s, 80s running the wishbone, running the old wing tee. Um, I remember my high school that I graduated from about 15, well, 20 years ago now, they brought in a guy named uh, Bob Christmas, and he's a great high school coach. He went up to Virginia, coached as well, good guy. Um, and he looked at my high school, where I graduated from, North Hall High School, um, not overwhelmingly blessed with natural athletes, but what he saw was determined younger kids who made like they size, they had energy, they would get in there and they get the game. And so he had, you know, like six foot 185 guards. You know, he, I mean, they were just, and he put in the wing tee and he went on a run for state uh, playoffs and everything else because one, other defenses hadn't seen it. And if it's executed right, you you can move. But we just, it's just sort of interesting to see the old school now to the new schools, hunk it and chunk it kind of thing. Oh, gosh. Uh, everybody likes to, unfortunately, Everybody likes to throw the football. They like to see the ball in the air. I, you know, yeah, you're talking to the wrong guy. You know, <laughs> talking to somebody that uh, that wants to throw the football. I wanted to throw it when I had to. You know, I wanted to run it when we could. So, yeah, uh, yeah you and I, you and I go back to the old uh, Al Sorrelli days at Georgia Tech. Oh my God, there's one, two, three, front up the middle. Toe meets letter. Good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you know Pepper was it Pepper Rogers? You know, uh, three yards in a cloud of dust. You know, yes. it was uh, the old saying. Uh, oh, by the way, as we look at this change from uh, running backs into the other, um, speaking of the draft, and we saw this a little bit. Philadelphia basically becoming University of Georgia North. Uh, defensively, I mean, it's pretty amazing <laughs> at what they do. Or, or you could just call it SEC pro football. I mean, because you know, with Jalen and everybody else, I mean, so this is there. Um, quick overlook from pros after the draft. You know, I know we talked about it. You know, briefly. Um, just what's your general impression so far going into the year? Do you see any movement? Anybody that you feel from talking to coaches, talking to others, that say, "Hey, you know, they've been struggling the last couple of years, but." This actually could work. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a give you a team to w- watch out for this year, the okay. L.A. Chargers. L.A. Chargers, okay. Yep. Uh, I, they, their defense is going to be pretty good. Uh, I like the way their quarterback's coming on. Um, they're in a tough division with Kansas City, which makes it really hard. But uh, just I think they're going to be – I think they're going to be better this year. I'm looking forward to following them. Do you think Herbert's actually coming along as a quarterback? I do. I, I think he's going to be fine. Well, and that brings up the question here that we, we've talked about before, you know, about the prominence of a quarterback and the prominence of, you know, again, maybe even our conversation earlier today about Caleb Williams and some of these others. And I, I actually felt, and, I, and James gave me a hard time on Friday about it, I, I mean, I just think Caleb's overrated right now. I think he's a good player. I wish they would leave him alone. I wish they would just say, you bring him up, then bring, get him to the pros and, and develop him. Cause I think he's got a great ability, but saying he's going to be the next, whatever is, is not helping him. And, you know, Ryan Leafish kind of stuff here, you know, Oh, he's going to change the world. He never made it past, you know, the first play, the quarterback cycle is, um, you know, now we've got, you know, Bryce Young at Carolina, smaller quarterback, um, you and I briefly mentioned this before. Let's just bring it up again. Bryce has the, in, in my mind, Tua, because you've been with uh, that situation, these smaller quarterbacks, good athletes, smaller quarterbacks, though, 
have had trouble. Kyler Murray comes to mind. Other, it's not the athletic run version of the quarterback. It, to me, it's this, and I hate to say this, but it's the size. I mean, because yeah. Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, nobody will say that they're not two of the best quarterbacks ever, and they run all over the field. Yeah. But yet they're durable when it comes to, you know, being able to see, being able to throw it, and also take a hit. Right. And, you know, there's some guys that can take a hit and some guys that can't. You know, and that's the that's the problem. And the hits in the NFL compared to college are are bigger and tougher and harder and they hurt more. Uh, so um, you have to have a guy that can, that can take a hit and get up or at least he knows how to avoid the hit a little bit. And I think that um, guys today, I think that um, players today uh, that play quarterback are getting better about learning how to take a hit, not trying to make um, a great play every snap. They've learned how to, okay, I go, I go down, yeah. I go down. Now, a guy runs out of bounds and there's five, uh, a guy's five yards from me, that, that makes me a little mad, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. but but at the same time, uh, I think they've gotten better about learning how to protect their bodies a little bit, and uh, that's the only thing that's going to save them. Because you're right, size will get you in the long run if you don't if you can't take those hits. But the bottom line is, of how do you avoid the hits? And that's what they're learning to do. I remember years ago there was some discussion in the NFL, the discussion in college football, it was just all around. And about coaches, especially with running backs and with wide receivers and others, uh, doing tumbling or gymnastics. They, they was learning, and basically what they were saying is learning to fall. And yes. I heard, a, I heard just recently heard a, a, a commentator, a scout was talking about like Mahomes and some others had learned how to fall. They and and they were taking that that helped them along. I think Brady was pretty good at that. You know, learning how to you know tuck, run, roll, not just go straight. Is that still emphasized a lot on the pro level now? No, it's really? not. It's not at all. Um, because, and and I think it should. Yeah. But it's not. I, and I, I don't know. I'm, I may have mentioned it to you. When I was in the eighth grade, our head football coach made every player take tumbling. Oh, really? Yeah. We had to take it. Yeah. Uh, to learn how to fall. And so, um, I think that there's a real advantage to doing that. You know, even the old monkey roll that we used to do, yeah. you know, you learn how to fall and roll and not, yeah. not break your elbow when you land and right. stuff like that. Uh, there, there's some real um, advantages to learning how to fall and how to not try to break your fall with your elbow or your hand or, you know, get your wrist hurt, things like that are just, popping your head back again on the turf when you land. Yeah. You yeah. know, things like that. So uh, <clears throat> it should be emphasized more. It's not as emphasized as much as it needs to be. Uh, and it helps every team and every player who will, you know, force themselves. I remember we there used to be five years ago, somebody was trying to do uh, team yoga, team ballet, team that kind of stuff. And the player said, I ain't doing ballet. Now, I don't care what you say. I ain't doing it. And <laughs> uh, you you probably have to get over the stigma of saying, we're going to do tumbling, you know, here <laughs> in, in the off season. So. Yeah. I mean, and I think that but it, it's interesting, though, that something that worked. You know, yeah. Because, because you know, I, I'm not a believer in this idea that um, the – you know, everything's just changed and all because you can't tell me, yes, they're harder hits now, they're bigger, faster, stronger. I get that. But you also had a lot more endurance in some of our older athletes, you know, the you know, back then. And I'm not saying everything was great back then because you had a lot of energy. You see that today being lived out in unfortunately in some of these people's lives. But you know, but they did stay a little bit longer because they could take a hit. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. And and they weren't you know, they weren't protecting the quarterbacks like they protect them now. I mean, they protect them a bunch right now. 
So uh, th- those were, but I think we were a tougher society back then. There wasn't as much, you know, guys walked where they or rode their bike. They didn't ride in the car everywhere. They, you know, there wasn't air conditioning everywhere. Yeah, I think I think it just was a a tougher group of of people that played back in the day, and um, and now we, you know, everybody's got air conditioned cars unless they're driving convertibles, which most of them are. So. Yeah, and I think that's one of the issues we got going on. Um, and, and I'm having some construction done around here, it looks like. But the uh, one of the questions that I have, and let's turn before we go to, to college, is our own backdoor Atlanta Falcons, okay? Hometown Georgia folk. Uh, we, we got to, at the beginning of this, discussing the, the absolute deplumbing of value of running backs. And, of course, the Falcons go out and, and in the first round, draft B. John Robinson from Texas. Okay, to go along with the tight end that we drafted Pitts in the first round from a couple of years ago, who we never throw to, who's supposed he's got skills that are, are pretty amazing. You've got a quarterback that's untested, Desmond Ritter. Um, you, you've added into the defense. Where do you see the Falcons this year, Coach? Um, they're going to struggle, to be honest with you. I, I see them struggling. I. Uh, but I don't know that their division is that strong either. To be, you know, I, I don't know where Carolina is. I don't know where the Saints are. I don't know where Tampa is. You know, it's uh, their 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 division is not the strongest division. So um, if they can play, if they can get it together early, um, and again, they got some weapons. They, they hopefully they'll get the ball to to those guys and let them play and. Uh, it'll be it'll be a good product on the field, but you know uh, th- that division right now is struggling as a whole. So the NFC East is where the strength uh, of the NFC is right now. So uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Uh, yeah, I agree, and I think it's going to be interesting. You know, a quick a quick question here, you since we brought up the, the NFC South. Is Baker Mayfield the starting quarterback for Tampa at the first game? Oh, I doubt that. <laughs> I mean, it, Baker's it, just had it, a hard time. He's had a hard time. And and you know what? I liked him coming out. I did. I liked him. Uh, but uh, he got thrown to the wolves. He got his confidence shaken, and then he got it back. And then he just hasn't been able to – capitalize anywhere he's been. And uh, to me, uh, I mean, you take Ron Fitzpatrick. Uh, th- th- there's a guy that I had. I was fortunate to coach, but he was pretty dang successful wherever he went. You know, he won He won a bunch of football games and got his teams close to being to the playoffs almost every year. You, you, There was confidence around him. I don't know. Uh, and I haven't been around Baker, so it's not fair for me to say it. But um, I don't know how much confidence he has and the people around him have in him at yeah, this point. I think at a certain point in time, it also takes away from your own confidence. You can be a very confident person. You've gone through what he's went through and everything else. It's been tough. He can. And, and, that, and, and the next thing I'm going to say about that, because you, you have to say where he came from, and that was Cleveland with Deshaun Watson. OK, and that whole issue, which we've talked about a little bit here on the show. And, I, and I'm saying this from a perspective of somebody who's watched Deshaun since he was seven years old. OK, right. I've known him. He's been in my house. I mean, when he was a kid, um, I, I don't like where I see him right now. I'll be just be frank. I, I want the best for him. He's come through a lot. I think he's trying to get by that. But, Coach, you know, you talk about this idea of, uh, you know, working and working out hard and everything else. And. You know, social media has become the platform for all these players. And I would expect him after the half, of you know, less than a half a season, you know, being in Cleveland basically all the time, working, you know, getting with these players. And yet you don't see any evidence of that. You see him in Europe for the last month. And, you know, do you think Deshaun can come back? Uh, can he? Yeah. Yes, he has the ability to. Yeah. Now. Uh, you get paid $140 million and, uh, you know, you think uh, that you've arrived and you can go to Europe for a month. Uh, 
the what's your makeup? Who are you? Yeah. You know, that's the key. And th- that's the research that you have to do on guys before you pay them a lot of money. What are they going to be like once they get that money? Are they still going to be the hungry guy? Are they still going to be the leader? Are they still going to be the type of guy that you want to represent your football team? And uh, some guys can handle that. Some guys can't. So yeah. can he? Yes, because he has the talent. He yeah. is a very talented guy. He's a very smart guy. But uh, the intangible parts of, of playing quarterback and being a leader and uh, on your football team, those things now are critical to being successful. You you can't just go out there and expect to play good uh, on Sundays. You right. got to – there's more to it than that. Yeah, he's – and look, for folks who don't know, he comes from solid, okay? I, his mom, I mean, he comes from solid. He's got a lot yeah. of still supporters down here in Georgia in Gainesville that, you know – but I, and I hope the best for him. But, again, sometimes it was, it was sort of concerning because I saw the sort of the same things out of that social media kind of feed that all of a sudden then led to what we saw in Houston. And then now, so, I mean, again, I hope the best for him. I want these players to do well. Uh, another Clemson quarterback that I think is going to have an outstanding year, I just believe it, this year, Trevor Lawrence in Jacksonville. Yeah. Well, and you go back to didn't play very well as a rookie. Right. You know, didn't play well the first half of his next year, but then all of a sudden things started happening for him, and uh, I, I think they've got a chance to be a very good football team this year. Very yeah, they got good. they got a good coach. They got they got they brought in some good players around him. So it's gonna be interesting to see how and, and that owner down there seems to you know again spend he'll spend the money so uh, yeah. to get what it needs. All right, switching to to college football for a second. One of the it is interesting always in the early season to listen to sports radio, and I know you get to hear this from coaches' <laughs> perspective. It is always amazing to me that Notre Dame, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas, the perennial. Old Penn State, you know, USC, or, oh, this is their year they turn the corner, okay? Nebraska probably has had a bigger fall than most, okay? Yeah. And Matt Rule is now there who turned around Baylor. Didn't do as well in the in, in Carolina. I think there's probably some just personality issues there more than anything else. He's now in Nebraska. They're, they're getting some players or not. Is Matt one of those, do you think, in Nebraska that they just say, okay, Five years, we'll evaluate you in five years. If we, you know, or, or two, three years, we're going to see progress. You know, if you go zero and ten, zero and ten, you're done. But I mean, if is that Nebraska? Do they have to be long term in their thinking? Have to be. They have to be long term in their thinking. They have got it, Nebraska as you and I knew it growing up. Yeah, and Nebraska today are two totally different things now. Uh, those people still love it up there, but that is a long way, a long way from nowhere, you know, yeah. to get to <laughs> Nebraska. And you, you've got to, you've got to have um, something a little unique to be a great recruiter at, at Nebraska. And they brought back Scott Frost, who I really like as a football coach, and he was a hometown guy, yeah. and he struggled to do it. And they gave him a long time. They did. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, but um, Matt's a uh, Matt's a quick worker. He he can turn things in a hurry. And you know, going back to what you said, Nick Saban and Steve Spurrier were didn't have success in the pros, right? But they're great college football coaches. And Matt may be the same same kind of guy. Yeah. You know, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if if they aren't if they aren't better. Um, but they don't have to be a lot better because I don't know how good that conference is. That, that's the best part of the problem. Uh, moving on, uh, we meant, you mentioned him earlier, being the best, one of the best athletes around, uh, Deion Sanders. He now has a chance. Uh, he's been given a chance at Colorado. He's went there. He chose – uh, my, my understanding was just from reading media reports, not having inside knowledge, he probably had a chance at some other schools that he chose not to go to, probably even a little bit bigger names maybe a little more defined program, but he wanted Colorado. So I, there's been a lot said in the offseason about him basically going in and saying, you know, and, and it's been interesting, the old schoolish and the non-old schoolish, he goes in and basically says, I, you're not part of my program. You know, I'm encouraging you to leave. Okay. 
And some of the old school folks saying that's just not right. You're supposed to take who you got. You're supposed you know, you work with these kids. And then others are saying, well, that's just life now in the, in the pros and in, in, in professional college football. Um, because these kids can do the same thing. They can now yeah. basically move for money and, and everything else. Um, not to spend a long time here, because I think it's just going to be in the proof in the pudding. Um, do you think he's building it in a sense of what you've seen so far to compete in the Pac-12, and now they may be moving out? That's a, a com. Um, does that style work? I mean, the work ethic style, the the holding accountability. I, I got to say, Coach, I'm impressed. I mean. You know, he's he's held them to a high standard. He talked about their personal conduct, um, which, I, you know, again, I think is, is very good. Has he set the bar? And I don't, this is hard for me to say because I, I like to set bars high. Has he set it almost too high for himself? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, okay. the, first of all, I, I have uh, great respect for Dion. I was able to coach him there for a couple of years, and uh, I have a great respect for Dion. Uh, the other thing is I've got, I know some coaches that are there with him mm. and they talk about what a strong disciplinarian he is that, and I don't know how, win, how, how big he will win, but he will create young men. Yep. And that, that's, you know, that's missing from our society today too. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, let, let, let's look and see how he does you know, in the win-loss column, but I know he'll do it the right way. I believe he'll do it the right way. I believe he will create young men, quality young men who have accountability, who have some self-discipline, and uh, they'll be productive in society after they leave. If they'll stay with him for four years, yeah. they'll be productive in society. Yeah, I agree. Uh, switching uh, back again more toward the, the two, what the, you know, all said is the two major conferences. Now you got the Big Ten and you got the SEC. You got Ohio State. You got Michigan. Harbaugh staying at Michigan, I think, was still a, a pretty much a surprise for most people um, that he did stay, but he stayed. You got Michigan. You got Penn State, Franklin. I mean, they'll win eight, nine games, ten games. I, I don't think they'll, you know, I think they, there's a little bit of a lag there. Uh, so I'll give them their props. I mean, from that perspective, okay, and, and they play. Moving to the SEC, um, you mentioned something just a second ago, and it, it pains me to talk about this. But instead of talking about two national titles back to back, two of the, the this year's recruiting class amazing. Next year's recruiting class, the offensive line in 2024 at the University of Georgia, six 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 seven six 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 seven three. I mean, all across the board, it's like I mean, it's just stunning. And the fact that everybody's now making fun of Georgia's schedule. They can't make fun of anything else, so now they're going to make fun of Georgia's schedule for this year, basically saying, you know, it's to run. But we've not talked about that, Coach. And you've seen it nationally. We've seen it here locally. We've talked about the off-field stuff that we've not seen before. And now it's like one thing. When somebody picks a scab, everybody else will, will jump on the scab. As a coach... You can only do, and I look, I'm not letting Kirby off the hook. I'm not letting the coaching staff or the culture off the hook, but there's only so much you can do. Kids are going to get speeding tickets. Okay. That's, I mean, I got two boys. Okay. They're going to get speeding tickets. They don't need to be stupid, but they're going to get speeding tickets. And, and the tragedy that happened earlier this year with those, uh, that wreck, Jalen is not over. There's going to be more. There's two lawsuits that have been filed again already. The concern has come, if you're, if you're reading into it, is that, Kirby is not taking what the world would like to see this as seriously as they think. I know he's probably taking them and they're, you know, running to they puke kind of the old mentality kind of stuff. But is there something else here? I mean, are we missing it or is, or, or is, and, and also the second effect from a locker room, how do you see this affecting Georgia going into what could be really a legitimate three-peat run if they, you know, because they got the athletes. That's not the problem. The quarterback's going to be an issue, but we'll see. But does this, how much does this off-field stuff really, it, it, is, it, is it an indicative of a crack in the foundation or is it an anomaly? Well, uh, let, me, let me just address something at the outset here. And I may have said this to you before, but um, football is a unique sport. Okay, it, 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 it's it's a very unique sport in the fact that 
you and your buddy can say, hey, let's go out in the backyard and shoot a few baskets. Or you and your buddy can say, hey, let's go in the back and throw the ball back and forth, you know, get our gloves and let's go, let's go throw some. Very seldom do you hear two guys say, hey, let's go in the backyard and run full speed into each other. You know, that that just doesn't happen. <laughs> You know, football is an edge sport, it, and it has edge people in it. And if you expect them to be uh, angels all the time and then to be terrorists on the weekend, you know, that's that, that's not going to happen. They're, they're edge people. And um, so they live a, a lot of life on the edge and you have to learn to control that. Don't get me wrong. You have to learn to control that and, and make it where it's just when you're on the field, but most people can't have a hard time separating that out. So that being said, going to the next part is um, in our society today, and I, I'm getting very philosophical here on you in our society today, we don't tend to admire greatness. We tend to tear down greatness. You are uh, because, so right, Coach. You are so right. Because we don't, we're not going to fight to get up to where they are, so we got to tear them down to get to where we are and make ourselves feel better about where we are. So uh, to me, if you're not getting torn down, you haven't done anything. Uh, George has done something. They're going to get criticized for hangnails. Okay. <laughs> exactly. We got, exactly. We got too many hangnails. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, if speeding tickets are the biggest problem that Kirby has, he's in good shape. Yeah, he's going to be fine. Um, he's going to be fine. And uh, it won't affect the locker room at all. Okay. Let me tell you something. When they line up to go to practice and go to play, they're in their element. That's yeah. their element. And hey, they'll hey. be fine. I mean, okay, I'm gonna, you may laugh at this, but I got some good buddies of mine that we always talk about. You know what my biggest concern is? And I'm just going to be honest, there's a lot of the Georgia Bulldog Nation who concerned about this. Our biggest concern is Mike Bobo calling plays. Well. Uh, <laughs> I'm just being honest. You know, uh, really? <laughs> yes. Well, don't, um, don't get bent out of shape until you see what happens. You know, exactly. you, you, what y'all are before, doing, coach. You, you're creating, you're creating anxiety in your heart and your soul <laughs> over something that hadn't even happened yet. Wait a little, just give it time. Give it time. So you, th so you think that seven years or so away would did wonders for the soul? Is that what we're saying? Let me tell you, I, I, seven years in this business, in the yeah. coaching business, you get a lot of different perspectives about how things are done. Yeah, you do. I had a friend of mine. We were talking one day. If you remember that, what was the the Outback Bowl or something? Is like eight, six, seven years ago before Bobo left the first time. It they the offense was killing it. If you remember, they were winning. They're beating Michigan like twenty. I can't remember. It may not have been Michigan, but they were winning. You know, they scored twenty eight points in the first half. Everything was going, and then the second half we came out and we we just fumbled all around. I think we ended up winning, but it was just there. And I had a friend of mine say, what did they do? Did they unlock the bathroom door for Bobo to get out at halftime? Oh, that's so bad. That <laughs> I is so don't bad. know. But I anyway. remember the Falcons having a 28-3 lead, too. Oh, yeah, very much so. And, um, and that guy is now one of the most successful offensive coordinators – I mean, head coaches at San Francisco. Yeah, it's, so, scary. it's scary, isn't it? Uh, yeah, um, but, but yeah, we go we go through. Uh, speaking of that, that's the you know goes back to head coaching too, and I think that sets the standard. And I think Kirby, I think you're right. It, but but again, when it gets played up, when it gets you know done, you know. It, it, but again, the amazing thing about Kirby Smart, and, and again, everybody talks about Saban and his recruiting, and I I got to you know give him credit. Kirby Smart helped Saban's recruiting when he was at Alabama, and now Kirby running it like he's doing now is it, is pretty impressive. Oh, very impressive. So what they've done is amazing. And um, and he's, you know, he's one with class, which I appreciate. He's one with class. I like Kirby a lot. Yeah, Kirby's, I, I, Kirby's funny. I mean, you just listen. Uh, also, by the way, for those who don't know, Kirby's got the number one quarterback prospect in the country in the 2024 uh, recruiting class. 
And just so happens he decides to come and, and coach. You'll laugh at this. He decides he's going to play high school, his last year of high school football in Buford. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the know, University those, of Buford. The yes. University of Buford. For those around the country who do not may not get that inside joke there, just look up Buford High School football, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a whole thing down here. But he's coming to Buford, which puts him within 45 miles of the campus in, uh, in Athens. He's going to be right there. And I think he actually brought in another receiver is going to be coming to, to Buford as well. Uh, really? Yeah. And then he, you know, so again, the, and, and legit moves, they move from Arizona, his family moves. So we'll see how it all, it all works out. Who's your sleeper this year in the SEC coach? Wow. Here's Boy, a that sleeper is a question. great question. Uh, I, I don't know that there are sleepers out there. Uh, you know, last year, everybody was on A&M. Oh, yeah. Everybody, oh, A&M, they, they're going to be, <laughs> whoo. That didn't turn out right. Speaking of uh, which, you think this is Jimbo's last year at A&M? Uh, probably. Okay. Probably. I don't think he turned. I don't think they turned it around. Yeah, the only thing that's got him is that contract they got. <laughs> yeah, he's. Got, I, I know they got, agent. I know. I know. I, they got. They they got a lot of money at A and M, but that's a that's a big contract. <laughs> uh, and I think you know. It, everybody's going to be a little bit on a wait and see with Oklahoma and Texas coming in, you yeah. know, to see how that's going to play out, what direction it's going to go, um, how they're going to handle all of this. Um, that, that'll be interesting uh, as well. Uh, but I, I don't have a sleeper. I wish I had a good thought for you, but uh, it, Georgia and Alabama are the two, top dogs they i think they're gonna stay there i don't see anything changing you know uh, unless somebody comes out of the woodwork with some kind of great quarterback somewhere because there's not a lot of those out there well see and that's also the interesting part the whole league is going into the year in which you don't have that quarterback still i mean even georgia right. and alabama i mean i'll be frank i know the names of the georgia i don't know who's going to be on the game the first day I mean, yeah. I think I think that's even sort of out there. Alabama is sort of an – I mean, Alabama brought in a kid after the spring game, um, yeah. which, again, is interesting as you look at. Um, going far – LSU, though, I'm not not a big fan of their coach. But, again, LSU, they seemed to build some momentum toward the end of the year last year. They did. They did. They played better. They played – you know, uh, they had some big wins and – um, he's he's done a good job down there, which I thought that would be uh, impossible to do. Him trying to go from Notre Dame down there, but uh, it seems to have worked a little bit, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. But uh, any, anybody can do anything for a half a season. Let's right. see. Let, let's see how this thing plays well, it, out. It works out. Two of the teams that I always question in my heart when nobody talks about them I sort of worry until they get through the three or four games and see how they're playing and that is is Auburn continuing to be a dumpster fire and is Florida your old place is it making improvements or is it still a few years off yeah well and, and there's another interesting um team out there to be honest with you uh, South Carolina they get yeah, right yeah, there I, stayed. Yeah, first aid, and they had a couple of big wins there, to, you know. So uh, that's another one to to keep an eye on. Uh, yeah, I'm watching that game in September at at Sanford. Uh, yeah. Spencer and them come into Sanford, and they're embarrassed last year. Um, yeah, you know, and Beamer's. I mean, he's a good. He seems to be a good young coach. Yeah, I think so. You I know, think he, he is. He is, and he comes. Well, he's got a great pedigree. I mean, he comes out yeah. of you know sure. the old stuff. It's going to be interesting. Tennessee, it'll be essentially if, if uh, what Hopples can do up there this year with, the the again, another older quarterback, um, you know, coming through. Again, I think there's some issues because they lost all their receivers. They lost everything else. So it's going to be interesting uh, to see that. Uh, and then we come to our last question of SEC football. Our our, 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 our perennial, oh, my Lord, what's he going to say this time? Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> you know, he is the hype master. You know, oh, yeah. he can create so much hype, and then it never pans out. Yeah. You know, so um, 
everybody, uh, the media loves him because, like you said, he'll say anything. So yeah. uh, he, he didn't he didn't come from my era of Chuck <laughs> Nolan. Um, yeah, you know, that crew were didn't say anything. So. Yeah, he didn't do the Vince Dooley well. We're playing zero and thirteen Ball State this weekend, but we've got to watch out for them. They got a ball club that'll <laughs> beat you on any given day. We're we're just going to be happy if we can stay with them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. All right, Coach. Well, this this is our preview. We'll get into a bigger preview in August uh, for our folks. Uh, everybody loves having you on. And after we get sort of lineup set, we see the games coming together. Um, all is well, but coach, it's always great to have you on. Always great to get your insights on both college and uh, pros. Uh, go out and have a great golf game. Thank you. I'm planning on getting out there as soon as possible. There you Take go. Take care. Right. See you. Take care. Hey, bye.